the abandoned building stood at the edge of town like a shadow forgotten by time. Locals called it the Old Havensworth Asylum, a name whispered in hushed tones as if the very sound could summon the dead. Its windows were dark eyes, peering out from beneath a roof that sagged like the brow of a tired giant. Stories about the building were as old as the town itself, tales of madness, ghostly apparitions, and unspeakable experiments. Lena had always been drawn to the macabre, her curiosity often pulling her towards the forbidden. That's why, on a fog-drenched October evening, she found herself standing before the gates of the old Havensworth Asylum, clutching her flashlight and a camera. She had heard the legends, but needed to see it for herself. Her friends had dared her to spend the night inside. But it wasn't just about proving them wrong. It was about the thrill, the unknown. As she pushed the iron gates open, they creaked like a scream caught in a throat. She glanced back at her car parked a good hundred feet away, a silent witness to her folly. The path leading to the front door was overgrown with weeds and scattered with broken glass. Each step closer to the building felt heavier, as if the ground itself was warning her to turn back. But Lena was not one to heed warnings. The front door of the asylum was ajar, hanging on rusted hinges. She stepped inside and immediately felt the temperature drop. The air was thick with the scent of mold and decay. Her flashlight beam cut through the darkness, revealing a long corridor lined with doors on either side, some closed, others gaping open like hungry mouths. Lena's footsteps echoed in the silence, bouncing off walls covered in peeling paint and old graffiti. Stay out, one of the messages read in red spray paint. She smirked at the warning and moved deeper into the building. She turned into one of the rooms, what appeared to be an old office. Papers littered the floor, and a desk sat overturned against the wall. As she stepped further in, her light caught something on the wall. A dark stain, almost like a shadow but with a deeper crimson hue. She reached out to touch it, then hesitated. It was sticky. Blood? She whispered to herself, feeling a chill run down her spine. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed down the hallway, and Lena jumped, her heart racing. She spun around, pointing her flashlight into the darkness. Hello? She called out, her voice trembling. There was no response, only the distant sound of dripping water. Lena took a deep breath and moved toward the source of the noise. She reached a stairwell, the steps descending into an even darker abyss. Every instinct told her to turn back, but a stronger force, perhaps her own stubbornness, pushed her forward. The basement was colder, the smell more pungent. Her flashlight flickered, casting erratic shadows on the walls. She cursed under her breath and tapped it, steadying the beam. The corridor down here was narrower, the ceiling lower. Pipes ran along the walls, some dripping, some corroded. Her footsteps echoed louder, sounding like the pounding of her own heart. Suddenly, she heard it, a faint, almost inaudible whisper. She stopped, holding her breath, straining to listen. It came again, this time clearer, a soft voice calling her name. Lena? She whipped around, the flashlight beam darting wildly, illuminating nothing but empty darkness. Her skin prickled with fear, yet she felt a strange compulsion to move toward the voice. She stepped carefully, her breath shallow, every sense on high alert. The voice grew louder, more insistent. Lena, come here. She rounded a corner and froze. At the end of the corridor stood a figure, shrouded in shadows. It was tall and thin, its face obscured by darkness. Lena's mouth went dry. Who, who are you? She stammered. The figure didn't answer, but instead moved slightly, revealing a door behind it, a metal door with a heavy lock, slightly ajar. The figure pointed towards the door, then vanished into the darkness as if it had never been there. Lena felt drawn to the door, despite the terror clawing at her gut. She moved slowly, each step feeling like she was pushing through thick mud. She reached the door and pushed it open, her flashlight illuminating a small room. It was empty except for a chair in the center and an old recording device on a table in the corner. Her curiosity peaked. Lena approached the device. It was ancient, covered in dust and cobwebs. She brushed them aside and pressed play. A low static crackled from the speakers, followed by a voice, a man's voice, distorted and eerie. They, they took them, they took them all. The screams, oh God, the screams. They never stopped. The experiments, the patients, they're still here. They never left. Lena's blood ran cold. She stopped the tape and turned around, intending to leave, but the door slammed shut with a deafening bang. 
She ran to it, pulling and banging, but it wouldn't budge. Panic set in, her breathing becoming rapid. Then she heard it, a soft scraping sound from behind. She turned slowly, the flashlight beam shaking in her trembling hand. The chair in the center of the room was moving, scraping across the concrete floor. She gasped, stumbling back against the door. The chair stopped, and for a moment, there was silence. Then, from the darkness, the whisper returned, louder this time, almost deafening. Lena, sit. Paralyzed with fear, Lena did as the voice commanded, her legs moving on their own accord. She sat in the chair, lay neck, her flashlight falling to the ground and rolling away, plunging the room into darkness. The door creaked open, and she felt a presence entering, moving closer to her. Cold hands grasped her shoulders, and she tried to scream, but no sound came out. She felt something sharp press against her temple, a searing pain shooting through her skull. Her vision blurred, and the last thing she heard before losing consciousness was the sound of her own voice, screaming. When Lena awoke, she was in her car, parked in front of the asylum. Her head throbbed, and she felt groggy, as if she had been drugged. She checked her phone. It was early morning. She couldn't remember how she got back to the car. As she sat there, trying to piece together what happened, she heard a noise. Her camera, sitting on the passenger seat, was recording. She picked it up and pressed play. The screen was filled with static at first, then slowly came into focus, revealing her own terrified face staring back at her, sitting in that chair in the basement room. And behind her, barely visible in the shadows, were dozens of figures, watching, waiting. The screen flickered again, and just before the video cut out, she saw one of the figures step forward, its face finally clear. It was her, another Lena, staring back with hollow, lifeless eyes. Her own voice whispered from the camera, we're still here. We never left. Story number two. The night air was thick with mist as David stood at the gates of the old Hargrave building. The towering structure loomed above him, an eerie relic of a time long past. Abandoned for decades, it had become the stuff of local legend, a crumbling monument to despair and whispered secrets. They said no one who entered ever came back the same. Yet here David was, driven by curiosity and a challenge he couldn't refuse. 30 minutes. His friend Paul had dared him earlier that evening. You last 30 minutes in that place and I'll buy you drinks for a month. It sounded easy enough then. But now, standing at the threshold, David wasn't so sure. Still, the building beckoned to him, the shattered windows like eyes staring into his soul. With a deep breath, he pushed open the rusted gate, the groan of metal slicing through the silence. Inside the building, the air was stale carrying a heavy scent of decay. The peeling wallpaper and sagging ceiling gave the place a haunted atmosphere. Every step David took echoed down the empty corridors, amplifying his growing sense of unease. He fumbled for his flashlight, the beam slicing through the darkness, illuminating the once grand lobby. Dust motes floated like ghosts swirling in the beam's path. This isn't so bad, he muttered to himself, trying to stave off the creeping dread. But then he heard it, a faint whisper, barely audible, like the wind through the cracks of the old structure. David froze, listening intently. The sound was soft, almost delicate, as if someone was speaking just behind him. He whirled around, but there was nothing. Just the empty hall, the walls lined with shadows that seemed to shift and move with a life of their own. It's just the wind, he told himself, shaking off the feeling. Yet, as he continued deeper into the building, the whispering grew louder. It wasn't the wind. There were voices, many of them. Some were hushed, others desperate, all tangled together in an eerie symphony that reverberated off the crumbling walls. David quickened his pace, his heart pounding in his chest. He rounded a corner and found himself in a long corridor lined with doors. Each door was identical, old, rotting wood with tarnished brass handles. The whispers seemed to be coming from behind the doors, growing more intense as he approached. He hesitated in front of the first door, his hand trembling as he reached for the handle. The whispering stopped abruptly, plunging the corridor into a thick silence. David's breath caught in his throat. He yanked open the door, his flashlight darting inside. The room was empty. Relief flooded through him, but it was short-lived. Behind him, the whispers returned, louder, more insistent. He turned to face the corridor again, but something was different. The doors? They had changed. The brass handles were no longer tarnished, but polished, gleaming in the light. 
The wood wasn't rotting anymore. It looked new, as if the building had been restored in the blink of an eye. David stumbled backward, his mind racing. This wasn't possible. He was hallucinating. He had to be. He closed his eyes and took a deep breath, willing himself to calm down. When he opened them again, the corridor had returned to its dilapidated state. The doors were once again old and decayed, and the whispers had faded. But something else had changed. There was a figure standing at the end of the corridor, a woman, her silhouette barely visible in the dim light. She didn't move, didn't speak, just stood there, staring at him. Hello? David called out, his voice cracking with fear. The woman tilted her head slightly, her long, dark hair falling over her face. She raised one hand and beckoned him forward. Against every instinct, David found himself walking toward her, as if pulled by some invisible force. As he drew closer, he could see her face more clearly, pale, almost translucent, with hollow eyes that seemed to pierce through him. She whispered something, but the words were incomprehensible, a jumbled mix of sounds that sent shivers down his spine. David stopped just a few feet away from her. What do you want? He whispered. The woman's eyes widened, and for a brief moment, David saw something flicker behind them. Fear. Desperation. She reached out, her cold fingers brushing against his arm. And in that instant, a flood of images overwhelmed his mind. He saw flashes of the past, people trapped inside the building, their faces twisted in terror as the walls closed in around them. He heard their screams, their pleas for mercy, and felt their hopelessness. The building wasn't just abandoned, it was cursed. It fed on the souls of those who dared to enter, trapping them in an endless cycle of torment. And now it wanted him. David jerked away from the woman, stumbling backward. The whispers grew louder, more frantic, as if the building itself was alive, hungry for another victim. He turned and ran, the corridor stretching out before him, longer than it should have been. No matter how fast he ran, the end seemed to get farther away. Panic consumed him as he realized the truth. He was trapped. The building wouldn't let him go. The walls seemed to close in around him, the whispers echoing in his ears, driving him to the brink of madness. Then, just as suddenly as it had begun, everything stopped. The whispers faded, the walls returned to their normal state, and David found himself standing at the entrance of the building, the exit just a few steps away. Breathless and disoriented, he stumbled outside, the cool night air hitting him like a wave of relief. He glanced back at the building, half expecting to see the woman standing in the doorway. Drac, but it was empty. Paul was waiting for him outside the gate, his face pale with concern. You were in there for hours, man. I thought something happened to you. David frowned. Hours? No, it was only 30 minutes. Paul shook his head. You went in at midnight. It's almost 4 a.m. now. David's heart skipped a beat as the realization hit him. Time had slipped away inside the building, just like the souls of those it had claimed before him. And as he turned to leave, he could still hear the faint whispers lingering in the air, a reminder that the building wasn't done with him yet. Story number three. The evening was quiet, but that quiet felt unnatural to Ethan as he approached the old Crestmore facility. Perched on the outskirts of town, it had been abandoned for years, a massive structure lost in a forest of overgrowth. Some said it used to be a mental institution. Others believed it was a place for unspeakable experiments. Whatever the truth, the place had an aura of dread, and Ethan could feel it pressing down on him as he drew closer. The front door hung slightly ajar, inviting him inside. He had come here on a dare from his brother Jake, who had always scoffed at ghost stories. You can't spend an hour there alone, Jake had said with a smirk. Ethan, always the one to prove himself, had taken the challenge. Now, as the shadows lengthened around him, he wasn't so sure. Ethan stepped inside, his footsteps echoing off the cracked tile floor. The flashlight beam cut through the thick darkness, revealing peeling paint, broken furniture, and graffiti left by trespassers who came before him. The place smelled of mildew and decay, with a lingering coldness that seemed to seep into his bones. He walked through the main hallway, past old examination rooms, their doors barely hanging on their hinges. Something about the place felt wrong, but not in the usual abandoned building way. It was too quiet, too still. The air felt heavy, as if it was holding its breath, waiting. And then he heard it. A faint scratching sound, like nails dragging across the walls. 
Ethan froze, the beam of his flashlight trembling in his hand. He swept the light across the corridor, but nothing was there. Just the long, empty hallway stretching into darkness. He moved forward cautiously, trying to convince himself that it was just the wind, or maybe an animal that had gotten trapped inside. But the scratching continued, growing louder, more insistent. It seemed to be coming from the walls themselves, as if something was trying to claw its way out. Ethan's breath quickened, his heart pounding in his chest. The sound was everywhere now, surrounding him, reverberating off the crumbling walls. He broke into a run, the flashlight beam bouncing wildly in front of him as he searched for a way out. He rounded a corner and found himself in a large room filled with old hospital beds. The walls here were covered in strange symbols, etched deep into the plaster. The scratching stopped suddenly, replaced by an oppressive silence that pressed down on him like a weight. Ethan shined his light on the symbols. They were crude, almost primitive, yet there was something about them that made his skin crawl. He had seen symbols like these before, in books about the occult. They were wards meant to contain something, something dangerous. A soft thud echoed from behind him. Ethan spun around, his light sweeping across the room, landing on one of the beds. The mattress had sunken in, as if someone or something was lying on it. But the room was empty. He edged closer, his nerves screaming at him to run, but his curiosity pushed him forward. As he approached the bed, a cold gust of air swept through the room, and the door slammed shut behind him with a deafening bang. Ethan jumped, whipping around to face the door, but it was too late. He was trapped. Panicking, he ran to the door and yanked on the handle, but it wouldn't budge. The room seemed to close in on him, the air thickening with the scent of rot. And then the whispers began, soft at first, barely more than a murmur. But they grew louder, layering over one another until they filled the room with a cacophony of voices. Ethan stumbled back, pressing his hands over his ears, but the whispers only grew louder. They spoke of pain, of suffering, of things that should never have been. Ethan tried to make sense of the words, but they were garbled, incoherent, as if spoken by dozens of different people all at once. Through the noise, he caught glimpses of shadows moving in the corners of the room, figures barely visible but undeniably there. They shifted and swayed, their forms distorted, like figures seen through frosted glass. Ethan's flashlight flickered, casting brief glimpses of something darker, something monstrous lurking just beyond his sight. Suddenly, the whispers stopped. The room fell into a deep, unnerving silence. Ethan lowered his hands from his ears, his breath coming in ragged gasps. The silence was worse than the noise. It felt heavy, unnatural, like the building was holding its breath. And then, from the far corner of the room, a voice, a single voice, cut through the silence. Help me. It was faint, almost a whisper, but it was clear enough for Ethan to hear. He shined his flashlight toward the corner where the voice had come from, but the beam revealed nothing but empty space. The voice came again, desperate, pleading. Please, help me. Ethan hesitated. Every instinct told him to leave, to find a way out of this nightmare. But something in the voice called to him, something that felt human. Against his better judgment, he moved toward the corner, his hands trembling as he held the flashlight steady. As he reached the corner, the air grew colder and the sense of dread deepened. He shined the light into the shadows, expecting to see something horrifying. But instead he saw a young woman huddled against the wall, her face pale and gaunt. She looked up at him with hollow eyes, eyes that seemed to carry a lifetime of pain. Help me, she whispered again, her voice barely more than a breath. Ethan knelt beside her, unsure of what to do. What happened to you? He asked, his voice shaking. The woman looked at him, her lips trembling. They trapped me here. They won't let me leave. Ethan reached out to her, but as his hand touched her shoulder, her form began to dissolve, like smoke in the wind. He jerked back, horrified, but before he could react, the whispers returned, louder this time, more aggressive. The walls began to shake, and the symbols started to glow with a sickly, pulsing light. Ethan scrambled to his feet, his mind racing. The woman's voice echoed in his head, repeating the same words over and over. They won't let me leave. They won't let me leave. Suddenly, the door behind him burst open and the whispers stopped. The room fell silent once more, the symbols fading into darkness. Ethan didn't hesitate. 
he bolted for the door, sprinting down the hallway, not daring to look back. As he burst out of the building and into the cold night air, he didn't stop running until he was far away from the cursed place. His breath came in ragged gasps as he finally collapsed on the ground, the building now a distant shadow. But even as he tried to calm himself, he couldn't shake the feeling that something had followed him, that the whispers were still there, lurking in the back of his mind. And in the silence of the night, he could still hear the woman's voice, whispering on the wind. They won't let me leave. Story number four. The old Langley factory loomed over the desolate street, its broken windows and crumbling facade a stark reminder of its tragic past. Once a bustling center of innovation and industry, it had been left to rot after a mysterious fire gutted the building 20 years ago. Locals spoke of the place in hushed tones, claiming it was haunted by the spirits of those who perished in the blaze. They said that at night, the ghosts of the factory's victims could be heard screaming in the darkness, their souls trapped forever within its decaying walls. Sam had heard the stories all her life. She'd grown up in the shadow of the factory, fascinated by its dark history. As a journalist, she'd written about the ghost stories, but she always felt there was more to uncover. When she received an anonymous tip suggesting there were records hidden inside the factory that could shed light on what really happened, she knew she had to investigate. It was a cold, windy night when Sam parked her car near the factory gates. The wind howled through the empty streets, rattling the chain-link fence surrounding the property. She zipped up her jacket and checked her flashlight. It flickered once, then steadied. With a deep breath, she pushed open the gate and stepped inside. The factory loomed larger up close, its walls towering above her like a fortress. The main entrance was sealed shut, so she made her way around the side, searching for another way in. She found a broken window, the glass jagged and sharp. Carefully, she hoisted herself through and dropped down onto the cold concrete floor inside. The air was stale, heavy with dust and the faint smell of smoke. Her flashlight beam swept across the room, revealing rusted machinery and piles of debris. The wind outside rattled the building's metal frame, making the entire structure groan as if it were alive. She moved cautiously through the dark, her footsteps echoing off the walls. The factory was eerily silent, save for the occasional drip of water leaking from the ceiling. She headed toward the back of the building, where she believed the records might be stored. As she walked, she couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. She stopped and turned, shining her light behind her, but saw nothing, just shadows and darkness. She told herself it was just her imagination, spurred on by the stories and the unsettling atmosphere. Reaching the far end of the factory, she found a door marked Records Room. The handle was cold and stiff, but with a hard push, it creaked open. Inside, the room was pitch black. She swept her flashlight across the space, revealing rows of old filing cabinets and stacks of papers strewn across the floor. Sam began to sift through the papers, searching for anything that might explain the fire. Most of the documents were water-damaged and illegible, but one drawer held a file that seemed relatively intact. She pulled it out and began to read. It was a report from a former employee, detailing strange occurrences in the weeks leading up to the fire. Unexplained noises, tools moving on their own, machines starting up without warning. As she read, a sudden noise behind her made her jump, a soft rustling, like fabric brushing against the floor. She turned quickly, shining her light toward the source. The beam fell on a figure standing in the doorway. Her heart skipped a beat. Hello? She called out, but the figure didn't move. It was shadowy and indistinct, almost like it was part of the darkness itself. She stepped closer, and the figure seemed to fade into the gloom. She shone her light around the room, but saw nothing. Taking a deep breath, she turned back to the file, only to find it was gone. Panic gripped her. She knew she hadn't put it down. She searched frantically around the room, but couldn't find it. The temperature in the room dropped suddenly, and she could see her breath misting in the air. The door slammed shut behind her, and she felt a chill run down her spine. She ran to the door and tried the handle, but it wouldn't budge. She pounded on the door, shouting for help, but the only answer was her own voice echoing back at her. Then she heard it, a faint whisper, almost inaudible, coming from the darkness behind her. She turned slowly, 
her flashlight flickering. The whisper grew louder, more insistent, though she couldn't make out the words. Suddenly, the lights in the factory flickered to life, and she was momentarily blinded by the brightness. When her eyes adjusted, she gasped. The room was filled with people, men and women, all in old-fashioned work clothes, their faces blank and expressionless. They stood silently, staring at her. Who are you? Sam asked, her voice trembling. The whispers grew louder, and she could finally make out the words. Help us find the truth. The factory workers moved closer, their faces twisted with anguish. Sam backed up against the door, her heart racing. What do you want from me? One of the figures stepped forward, a man with a scar across his cheek. We're trapped here, he said, his voice echoing as if it were coming from a great distance. Until the truth is known, we cannot leave. You must find it, the real cause of the fire. Sam felt a surge of pity. I'll help you, she promised. I'll find out what happened. The man nodded, and the lights flickered again. When they came back on, the figures were gone, and the door creaked open. Sam rushed out, her heart pounding. She had to find those files. She had to know the truth. As she made her way back through the factory, she heard a strange noise, an odd, rhythmic thumping. She followed the sound to a large room that looked like it had once been a storage area. The thumping grew louder, more insistent. She pushed open the door and gasped. In the center of the room was a massive old machine, its gears grinding and pistons pumping as if it were still operational. And next to it, on the floor, was the missing file. She ran over and grabbed the file, quickly leafing through the pages. Her eyes widened as she read the final report. The fire had not been an accident. It had been a deliberate act, an insurance scam orchestrated by the factory's owner, who had locked the workers inside to ensure no witnesses survived. As she read, she felt a presence behind her. She turned slowly, and there, standing in the doorway, was the factory owner himself, a gaunt, skeletal figure with hollow eyes. You weren't supposed to know, he rasped, his voice a harsh whisper. You were never supposed to find out. Sam backed away, clutching the file. They know now, she said, her voice shaking. And so will everyone else. The owner lunged at her, his hands outstretched, but just as he reached her, the ghostly figures of the workers appeared, surrounding him, dragging him back into the darkness. He screamed, a sound filled with rage and fear, but it quickly faded into silence. The lights flickered once more, then went out completely. Sam stood in the darkness, her breath ragged. She knew what she had to do. The next day, the local newspaper ran a front-page story detailing the factory fire's true cause. Sam had done it. She'd uncovered the truth. And that night, as she stood outside the factory, she heard a distant, faint sound. The sound of a thousand voices finally at peace. Story number five. It had been years since anyone dared approach the Wainwright Mill, an imposing structure that stood at the edge of Black Hollow Forest. The factory had shut down decades ago after a mysterious fire claimed the lives of its workers. Locals whispered about strange occurrences in the mill faint lights at night, shadowy figures moving in the windows, and a darkness that seemed to grow deeper every year. Despite the warnings, Tommy had always been drawn to the place, his curiosity overwhelming his sense of fear. Tonight, Tommy was determined to uncover the truth. Armed with nothing more than a flashlight and his phone, he crossed the crumbling bridge that led to the mill. The air grew colder as he neared, and a thick fog began to rise from the ground, wrapping around the building like a shroud. The massive wooden doors creaked open with a push, and Tommy stepped inside. The interior was dark, and the smell of charred wood still lingered in the air. The beams of his flashlight revealed broken machinery, rusted chains, and piles of debris left behind when the factory was abandoned. The silence was suffocating, as if the building itself had been holding its breath for decades. Tommy moved deeper into the mill, the floorboards groaning under his weight. His footsteps echoed in the vast emptiness, bouncing off the walls and creating an eerie symphony of sound. He tried to shake off the creeping dread that gnawed at the edges of his mind. After all, he had always believed that the stories about the mill were just tales spun by the superstitious townsfolk. There was nothing to be afraid of here. But as he turned a corner into the main factory floor, he felt it. A presence. It was subtle at first, just a tingle at the back of his neck. He stopped and listened, straining to hear over the pounding of his heart. 
the air seemed to thicken, pressing in on him from all sides. His flashlight flickered. Hello? Tommy called out, his voice trembling slightly. He half expected to hear nothing in return, but instead there was a faint sound, a soft rhythmic tapping, like someone drumming their fingers on a surface. He turned his flashlight toward the source of the noise, but there was nothing there. Just rows of old rusted machinery, their gears frozen in place. The tapping continued, growing louder and more insistent. It echoed through the vast room, seeming to come from everywhere at once. Tommy felt a chill run down his spine. His instincts screamed at him to leave, but his legs refused to move. The tapping grew louder still, morphing into a steady, pounding rhythm like the heartbeat of the mill itself. And then it stopped. In the silence that followed, Tommy's breath caught in his throat. He could feel eyes on him, watching from the shadows. Slowly, he turned, sweeping his flashlight across the room. The beam landed on a staircase leading to the upper level, where the offices used to be. Something at the top of the stairs caught his eye. A faint glimmer of light, barely visible through the haze of dust. Despite the fear gnawing at him, Tommy felt compelled to investigate. He climbed the stairs, each step creaking ominously beneath him. When he reached the top, he found himself standing in a long hallway lined with closed doors. The light was coming from the last room at the end of the hall, spilling out from beneath the door. He approached cautiously, his pulse quickening with every step. The door was slightly ajar, and as he pushed it open, the light inside flickered and went out, plunging the room into darkness. Tommy hesitated, his flashlight trembling in his hand. He stepped inside, shining the beam across the room. It was an old office, long abandoned, with papers strewn across the floor and furniture overturned. The walls were covered in soot, blackened by the fire that had consumed the mill. But something else caught his attention. A shadow, darker than the rest, standing in the corner of the room. It didn't move, didn't make a sound, but Tommy could feel its presence, oppressive and malevolent. He stepped closer, his heart pounding in his chest. Who's there? He whispered though he wasn't sure he wanted an answer. The shadow shifted, as if it were alive, writhing in the corner, and then slowly, it began to take shape. A figure emerged, tall and thin, its features obscured by the darkness. But Tommy could see its eyes, deep, hollow voids that seemed to swallow the light. The figure stepped toward him, its movements slow and deliberate. Panic surged through Tommy's veins. He stumbled back, the beam of his flashlight shaking as he tried to keep the figure in his sights. Stay back, he shouted, though his voice was weak, barely more than a whisper. The figure didn't stop. It moved closer, its form shifting and undulating like smoke. And then, just as it reached him, it vanished, dissolving into the air as if it had never been there at all. Tommy stood frozen, his mind racing. He had seen it. He knew he had. But now, the room was empty, silent, as if nothing had happened. He turned to leave, but as he reached the door, he heard it again that soft tapping sound coming from behind him. Slowly, he turned back toward the room. The shadowy figure was there again, standing in the corner, watching him. But this time, it wasn't alone. More figures began to emerge from the darkness, their forms barely visible in the dim light. They surrounded him, closing in from all sides, their hollow eyes fixed on him. Tommy backed away, his breath coming in short, panicked gasps. He had to get out of there, had to escape, he turned and bolted for the stairs, his flashlight beam bouncing wildly as he ran. But as he reached the top of the stairs, he froze. The staircase was gone. In its place was a solid wall of darkness, impenetrable and absolute. The way out had vanished, leaving him trapped in the mill with the shadows that lurked in the corners of the room. Tommy stumbled backward, his mind racing. The figures were closing in, their whispers filling the air, growing louder with every passing second. He could feel their cold breath on his skin, could hear the scrape of their footsteps as they moved closer. And then, everything went silent. The shadows stopped moving, the whispers faded, and for a brief moment, Tommy thought it was over. But then, the figures lunged. The darkness swallowed him whole, and the last thing Tommy heard was the sound of his own heartbeat, pounding in his ears, before it too was consumed by the shadows. In the quiet stillness of the night, the Wainwright Mill stood silent once more, its secrets buried deep within its walls, waiting for the next soul to wander too close. Story number six, 
The dilapidated old house at the end of Willow Lane was more than just abandoned. It was forgotten. Ivy crept over its brick walls, and its once gleaming windows were now broken, jagged teeth in a crooked smile. Local children dared each other to run up and touch the door before sprinting away, but no one ever lingered. They said it was cursed, haunted by the spirits of those who had disappeared within its walls decades ago. Mia didn't believe in ghosts, but she did believe in mysteries. An aspiring filmmaker, she had spent months documenting the haunted spots around town, debunking myths and exposing the mundane truths behind them. The Willow Lane House was to be her magnum opus, a final scare to prove the skeptics right. Her plan was simple. Spend one night inside, film everything, and uncover whatever real secrets the house held. Armed with her camera, flashlight, and a backpack of supplies, Mia made her way to the house just as the sun dipped below the horizon. The air was thick with fog, and the only sounds were the crunch of her boots on the gravel path and the distant croak of a frog. She pushed open the rusted gate, its hinges screaming in protest, and made her way to the front door. The wood was warped and weather-beaten, but it swung open easily, almost as if the house was inviting her in. Inside, the air was stale, carrying the faint scent of rot and something else, something metallic. She clicked on her flashlight, sweeping it across the dusty interior. Cobwebs draped from the ceiling like ghostly curtains, and broken furniture lay strewn about the floor. She set up her camera on a tripod and hit record. Here we are, she said to the camera, her voice steady despite the chill that crept up her spine. The infamous house on Willow Lane. Tonight, we find out if the stories are true or just another ghost tale. As she moved deeper into the house, the floorboards creaked under her weight, and the darkness seemed to swallow her light. She reached the living room, where an old piano sat against the wall, its keys yellowed with age. She ran her fingers over the keys, and a discordant note rang out, echoing through the empty house. Mia laughed nervously and moved on, her flashlight beam cutting through the gloom. She reached the stairs leading to the second floor and hesitated. The wood looked fragile, and she wasn't sure it would hold her weight. But curiosity won over caution, and she began to climb. The steps groaned with each footfall, and she half expected them to give way, but they held. The second floor was darker, colder. A long hallway stretched out before her, lined with doors on either side. She tried the first door on her left. It opened into a small bedroom, empty except for a single, child-sized chair facing the window. She shuddered, feeling a sudden, inexplicable wave of sadness. She backed out of the room and closed the door, moving on to the next. She continued down the hall, opening each door in turn. Most led to empty rooms, but the last door at the end of the hall was different. It was heavy, metal, with a thick layer of dust obscuring a brass plaque at its center. She wiped the plaque clean with her sleeve and read the inscription, Basement. A basement on the second floor? Mia frowned, her curiosity peaked. She pushed the door open and peered inside. Narrow wooden stairs descended into darkness. She hesitated, but then, driven by a mix of curiosity and the thrill of discovery, she began to descend. The air grew colder with each step, and the smell of damp earth and rust grew stronger. At the bottom, she found herself in a long, narrow corridor. Her flashlight flickered, and she tapped it against her palm, muttering under her breath. The light steadied, revealing a row of small, numbered doors lining the corridor. It looked like some kind of underground bunker. She approached the first door, labeled one. It was locked with a heavy padlock, but the lock was old and rusted. She gave it a tug, and it broke apart in her hand. She pushed the door open and stepped inside, raising her flashlight. The room was small, bare, with a single light bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the center of the room was an old metal bed frame, its mattress missing, and shackles attached to the posts. The walls were covered in scratch marks, long and desperate. Mia's breath hitched in her throat. What the hell? She whispered, backing out of the room. She moved to the next door, marked two, and opened it. The same setup, bed frame, shackles, scratch marks. And then the next room, and the next. All identical, all filled with the same horrifying details. Her pulse quickened, and she could feel her heart pounding in her chest. This wasn't what she had expected. She stumbled back into the corridor, her flashlight beam shaking. That's when she heard it, a soft whisper coming from further down the corridor. Help me. She froze, her blood running cold. 
The voice was faint, weak, but unmistakably human. She raised her flashlight and called out, <laughs> Hello? Is someone there? No response, just the soft, steady drip of water. She hesitated, then moved toward the sound, her footsteps echoing in the narrow space. As she approached the end of the corridor, she saw a door slightly ajar, with the number seven barely visible under a thick layer of grime. She pushed the door open with a trembling hand and stepped inside. The room was similar to the others, but in the far corner, slumped against the wall, was a figure, a woman, her clothes tattered, her face pale and gaunt. Her eyes were closed, and she was muttering something under her breath. Mia's breath caught. Oh my God, are you okay? The woman's eyes snapped open, and she lifted her head slowly. Her gaze met Mia's, and she smiled, a cold, unsettling smile. You shouldn't have come here, she whispered. Before Mia could react, the woman lunged at her with unnatural speed, her hands reaching for Mia's throat. Mia screamed and stumbled backward, dropping her flashlight. Darkness swallowed her, and she heard the woman's voice, now louder, echoing off the walls. You're one of us now. Mia scrambled to her feet, grabbing her flashlight and shining it around wildly. The woman was gone. The room was empty again, save for the bed frame and the chains. She ran out of the room, down the corridor, her heart racing. She needed to get out, needed to escape the nightmare that was unfolding around her. As she reached the stairs, the whispering returned, louder this time, a chorus of voices, all pleading, all desperate. Help us, don't leave us. She sprinted up the stairs, bursting through the door at the top and slamming it shut behind her. She leaned against the door, her breath ragged, her mind spinning. She needed to leave, to get out of the house and never look back. She ran down the hallway, through the living room and out the front door, not stopping until she reached her car. She fumbled with the keys, her hands shaking, and finally managed to unlock the door. She threw herself inside and locked the doors, her chest heaving. For a moment, she just sat there, staring at the house, its dark windows staring back like empty eyes. Then slowly, she looked down at her camera. It was still recording. She picked it up and hit playback, her hands trembling. The footage was grainy, dark, but as she watched, she saw herself enter the house, move through the rooms, and then descend the stairs to the basement. And then she saw it. Just before she opened the door marked seven, the camera caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure standing behind her. Not the woman, but a man, tall and thin with hollow eyes and a twisted grin. He reached out for her, and then the screen went black. Mia dropped the camera, her hands shaking. She turned to look at the house one last time and felt a chill run down her spine. In the upstairs window, she saw them, the woman and the man, standing side by side, watching her. And then, slowly, they raised their hands and waved. Mia didn't wait to see more. She turned the key in the ignition and sped away, leaving the house and its dark secrets behind. But as she drove, the whispers echoed in her mind, a chilling reminder of the darkness she had uncovered. Story number seven. Kathy leaned on the steering wheel, staring at the dilapidated factory looming ahead. The building had been abandoned for over 50 years, a relic of Redstone County's industrial heyday. Locals avoided it, calling it cursed, another one of those small town legends. But Kathy didn't believe in curses. She believed in stories, and this one was supposed to be a gold mine. As a freelance journalist, she dug up every rumor, every whisper about this place. Kathy was here for one reason to investigate the disappearance of four local teenagers who had ventured into the factory six months ago. They were never found, their car left behind on the edge of the property as though they had vanished into thin air. The police had searched the factory, of course, but came up empty. Now, Kathy was going to find the truth. She grabbed her camera and flashlight from the passenger seat, took a deep breath, and stepped out into the cool evening air. The wind whipped through the overgrown weeds, rustling the crumbling chain-link fence as she approached. The gate was already ajar, hanging on its hinges like a broken jaw. She slipped through and made her way toward the main building, her footsteps muffled by the thick carpet of dead leaves on the ground. The factory doors were massive, looming above her like the entrance to some forgotten tomb. Kathy pushed one open with effort, and it groaned in protest. The smell of rust and decay hit her instantly, and she wrinkled her nose as she stepped inside. The interior was dark, 
the last rays of the setting sun barely filtering through the cracked windows. Old machinery lay scattered across the floor, covered in layers of dust and grime. The silence was thick, broken only by the occasional drip of water from somewhere deep within the building. Kathy turned on her flashlight, the beam cutting through the darkness. She adjusted her camera, making sure everything was ready. This was her chance to get a story that would make her career, maybe even go national. The story of what really happened here. She moved deeper into the factory, her flashlight sweeping across the rusted equipment and forgotten tools. There were signs of life, graffiti on the walls, old beer cans littering the floor, but nothing recent, no sign of the missing teenagers. She paused at an old conveyor belt, studying the strange symbols painted in black across its surface. They were crude, almost childlike, yet something about them made Kathy's skin crawl. She zoomed in with her camera, capturing every detail, and moved on. The deeper she went, the colder it got. The air felt heavy, pressing against her lungs, making it harder to breathe. Kathy tried to shake off the growing unease gnawing at her insides. She'd been in dozens of abandoned buildings before each one with its own unsettling vibe. But this place was different. It felt alive, like the building itself was watching her. She reached a stairwell leading down into the basement. According to the old blueprints she'd found, this was where the factory kept its boiler room, storage, and maintenance tunnels. The teenagers had been heading down here too. Kathy hesitated at the top of the stairs, shining her flashlight down into the yawning blackness below. I've come this far, she muttered to herself, forcing her feet to move. The steps creaked under her weight as she descended, each one echoing ominously in the dark. The basement was worse than the upper floors, cold, damp, and stinking of mold and stagnant water. Kathy found herself shivering despite the heavy jacket she wore. Her flashlight caught the edges of old boilers, pipes, and ducts snaking across the ceiling like the veins of some enormous beast. She started down a narrow corridor, her footsteps splashing in shallow puddles. The walls here were different, thick with peeling paint, but beneath it, strange markings had been scratched into the concrete. At first, they seemed random, just scratches and scrapes left behind by decades of neglect. But as Kathy moved deeper, she began to notice a pattern. The symbols resembled the ones she'd seen upstairs, only here they were carved with more precision, as if someone had painstakingly etched them into the stone. A faint sound reached her ears, a soft scraping noise, almost too quiet to notice. Kathy froze, listening intently. It was coming from somewhere ahead, just around the next bend in the tunnel. She inched forward, her heart pounding in her chest. The sound grew louder as she approached, a rhythmic scratching like nails on metal. She rounded the corner and froze. In the middle of the corridor was a figure, hunched over, clawing at the floor with frantic, jerking movements. Kathy's flashlight flickered, and she could barely make out the ragged clothes hanging off the figure's thin frame. The hair was matted, filthy, obscuring the face, but Kathy knew immediately who it was. One of the missing teenagers. Hey, Kathy called out, her voice echoing in the narrow space. Are you okay? The figure stopped moving, the scraping noise abruptly silenced. Slowly, the figure turned its head toward her, and Kathy's breath caught in her throat. The teenager's face was gaunt, eyes hollow and dark, but it wasn't just the appearance that sent a wave of terror through her, it was the emptiness. There was no recognition, no relief, only a void, as if whatever humanity had once inhabited this person was long gone. Kathy took a step back, her mind racing. She had to get out of here. She had to. The teenager let out a low, guttural growl and lunged at her. Kathy screamed, stumbling backward, her flashlight slipping from her hand and clattering to the floor. The beam spun wildly, casting erratic shadows across the walls. She scrambled to her feet and ran, the sound of footsteps pounding behind her closer and closer. She didn't dare look back. She reached the stairwell and threw herself up the steps, her lungs burning as she raced for the exit. The heavy doors loomed ahead her only chance of escape. She slammed into them, her hands slipping on the rusted metal as she shoved them open and burst out into the night. She didn't stop running until she reached her car, breathless and shaking. Fumbling with the keys, she managed to get the door open and threw herself inside, locking the doors behind her. Kathy glanced back at the factory, now just a dark silhouette against the night sky. 
she could still hear the low growl in her ears, could still feel the icy grip of those hollow eyes. As she caught her breath, something caught her eye in the rearview mirror, movement in the back seat. She turned slowly, her heart hammering in her chest. The hollow-eyed teenager was sitting in the back seat, grinning at her. And then, everything went dark. Story number eight. The air was thick with a damp, musty smell as Jason pushed open the rusted gate, its creaking hinges echoing across the empty courtyard. The abandoned hospital loomed before him, a decaying monolith that had stood empty for nearly three decades. Weeds had overtaken the crumbling parking lot, and the once white facade was now a weathered shade of gray. But there was something else. Something about the way the building seemed to breathe in the darkness, like a sleeping beast waiting to be awakened. Jason hesitated for a moment, clutching the flashlight in his hand. He had heard the stories, of course. Everyone in the small town of Redfield had. Rumors of strange lights at night, of voices calling from inside, and of the disappearance of those who dared to enter. But Jason wasn't one to believe in ghost stories. He was here to prove a point and more importantly, to capture some footage for his rapidly growing YouTube channel. He'd made a name for himself exploring abandoned places, and this hospital was supposed to be his grand finale. He took a deep breath and stepped inside. The silence hit him immediately, thick and oppressive, broken only by the soft crunch of debris under his boots. He shone his flashlight around the lobby. Graffiti marred the walls, and shards of glass from shattered windows littered the floor but there was no sign of anything unusual. Jason clicked on his camera and began filming. All right, guys, he whispered into the lens. We're here. This is the infamous Redfield Asylum, closed down in 1991 after a scandal that rocked the town. Let's see if we can find any truth to the legends. The camera's red light blinked in the darkness as Jason made his way deeper into the building. The long, well, empty hallways seemed to stretch on forever, lined with abandoned rooms and broken equipment. Every so often, his light would catch something, a shadow that flickered just out of sight, a door that seemed to shift slightly on its hinges. But every time he turned to investigate, there was nothing there. Jason's pulse quickened, but he pressed on. He had to get this footage. The deeper he went, the more intense the feeling of being watched became. It was as though the walls themselves were alive, whispering secrets he couldn't quite hear. He reached the central wing of the hospital, where the patient rooms were located. Here, the air was colder, and the smell of mildew was almost unbearable. He paused outside one of the doors, which hung slightly ajar, and pushed it open with a trembling hand. Inside, the room was mostly empty, except for an old metal bed frame and a chair that had been overturned. But as Jason stepped inside, something caught his eye. On the wall opposite the door, written in a jagged script, were the words, Help me. Jason swallowed hard and moved closer. The writing looked fresh, as though it had been carved into the wall with something sharp. His camera zoomed in on the message, capturing every detail. Who would have done this? He muttered to himself. Suddenly, a loud bang echoed through the hallway behind him, causing Jason to spin around his flashlight shaking in his hand. He rushed out of the room and down the hall, the sound of his own footsteps pounding in his ears. He paused at the end of the corridor, trying to catch his breath, when he noticed something strange. The door to the stairwell was slightly open, but it wasn't just that. There were fresh footprints leading into it, wet, muddy footprints that hadn't been there when he passed by earlier. His heart raced as he stared at them. They weren't his, Jason aimed his camera at the footprints and took a deep breath. Okay, guys, he whispered shakily. We're not alone in here. He approached the stairwell cautiously, peering into the darkness below. The footprints led down into the basement. Jason hesitated, every instinct telling him to turn back, but his curiosity and his determination to capture something extraordinary propelled him forward. He descended the stairs slowly, each step creaking under his weight. The basement was even colder, and the stench of rot was overwhelming. As he reached the bottom, his flashlight flickered, casting eerie shadows across the room. The basement was vast, filled with old medical equipment and rusting metal cabinets. But it was what he saw in the far corner that made his blood run cold. There, huddled in the darkness, was a figure. A woman, her back to him, dressed in a tattered hospital gown. 
Her long, matted hair hung over her face, and she rocked back and forth, muttering something Jason couldn't quite make out. He swallowed hard, fear gripping him. Hello, he called out, his voice barely above a whisper. The woman stopped rocking. Slowly, she turned her head, and Jason's breath caught in his throat. Her face was pale, gaunt, her eyes hollow and empty. She stared at him for what felt like an eternity before a twisted smile spread across her lips. Help me, she whispered, her voice raspy and broken. Jason took a step back, his heart pounding in his chest. I, I can't, I need to go, he stammered, but his feet wouldn't move. The woman stood up slowly, her movements unnatural and jerky, as though her joints were stiff. She began to move toward him, her feet dragging across the floor. You promised, she hissed. You said you'd help. Jason's mind raced. Promised? He'd never seen her before. This couldn't be real. It had to be some kind of sick joke. But the fear in his gut told him otherwise. He turned and bolted for the stairs, his flashlight swinging wildly as he ran. He could hear her behind him, her footsteps growing louder, faster. He burst through the stairwell door and slammed it shut behind him, breathing heavily. For a moment, there was silence, and Jason allowed himself to believe that he had escaped. Then, a voice whispered in his ear, so close he could feel the cold breath on his neck. You can't leave. Not now. Jason spun around, but there was no one there. The hallway was empty, but the air had changed. The oppressive silence was gone, replaced by a low, rhythmic humming that seemed to come from the very walls themselves. He looked down at his hands, his camera still recording, the red light blinking steadily. But something was wrong. His reflection in the lens wasn't his own. It was hers. Jason's scream echoed through the empty hospital, but no one was there to hear it. Story number nine. Lara stopped her car on the outskirts of Ashfield, the small town where her childhood memories felt like fading photographs. She hadn't been back in years, but the call she'd received about her estranged brother, Adam, had forced her hand. He'd disappeared without a trace two weeks ago, last seen entering the old Ashfield Sanitarium, a decaying, abandoned building that had been left to rot on the outskirts of town. It was a place no one in their right mind would go near, especially not at night. But Adam wasn't in his right mind, not for a long time now. Lara took a deep breath and turned off the engine. The sanitarium loomed in the distance, its broken windows and crumbling walls barely visible through the thick fog that clung to the night. She grabbed her flashlight and phone, steeling herself for whatever she might find. As she approached the sanitarium, she couldn't help but feel the weight of the building pressing down on her, like it was alive with the memories of the people who had once inhabited it. Patients, doctors, the broken souls who had been sent there to be forgotten. She shuddered at the thought. The front door was ajar, and Lara pushed it open with a creak that echoed through the empty halls. The stench of mildew and rot hit her immediately, making her gag. She turned on her flashlight and stepped inside, the beam of light cutting through the thick dust that hung in the air like cobwebs. Adam? She called, her voice sounding small in the vast, decaying space. Only silence greeted her. She moved deeper into the building the old floors creaking under her boots. The place was a maze of long corridors, peeling wallpaper and rusted doors that hung off their hinges. Graffiti and strange symbols covered the walls, remnants of trespassers who had come before her. Yet, the deeper she went, the more she noticed a change. The air grew colder, and the graffiti seemed less random, more deliberate, like some twisted mural of madness. As she wandered through the labyrinth of forgotten rooms, Lara began to feel a growing sense of unease. She couldn't shake the feeling that she was being watched. Shadows seemed to move in the corners of her vision, but whenever she turned to look, there was nothing there. Her flashlight flickered, and she slapped it against her palm, muttering a curse under her breath. The last thing she needed was to be left in the dark. She pulled out her phone to check the time, but there was no signal, just static. Great! She muttered, slipping it back into her pocket. She reached a large central hallway lined with doors on either side, most of them closed, some hanging open like the mouths of long dead corpses. The air was thick here, heavier than before, and it was getting harder to breathe. She could hear a faint sound now, a soft, rhythmic thudding, like the beat of a distant drum. It was coming from somewhere deeper in the building. 
Lara followed the sound, her footsteps echoing in the empty hall. The thudding grew louder as she approached a door at the far end of the corridor. It was slightly ajar, and a faint light flickered from within. She hesitated for a moment, every instinct screaming at her to turn back, but she had to know. She had to find Adam. Pushing the door open, she stepped inside. The room was dimly lit by a single flickering light bulb hanging from the ceiling. In the center of the room was an old, rusted bed frame, its mattress long gone, and in the corner, huddled on the floor, was Adam. Adam! Lara rushed over to him, dropping to her knees beside him. His clothes were filthy, his skin pale and clammy. His eyes, once bright with mischief, were dull and unfocused. He didn't react to her touch, just stared ahead, muttering something under his breath. Adam, it's me. It's Lara, she said, shaking him gently. What happened? What are you doing here? He didn't respond, just kept muttering that same phrase over and over again. Lara leaned in closer, trying to make out the words. Not alone. Never alone. They're here. Always here. Lara's blood ran cold as she realized what he was saying. She looked around the room, her heart pounding in her chest. The shadows seemed to close in on her, pressing against the walls, suffocating her. She could feel them now, eyes watching, waiting. Suddenly, Adam grabbed her arm with a strength that surprised her. His eyes, now wide and terrified, locked onto hers. They're coming, Lara, he whispered, his voice hoarse and trembling. We can't leave. They won't let us leave. Lara pulled away from him, her mind racing. She had to get him out of here. She had to. The door slammed shut behind her with a deafening bang. Lara spun around, her flashlight flickering wildly as she shone it toward the door. She rushed over, trying the handle, but it wouldn't budge. She was trapped. Adam, we need to go, she shouted, panic rising in her throat. She yanked on the door, but it held fast, as if something was holding it shut from the other side. The temperature in the room plummeted, and Lara's breath came out in visible puffs of air. The soft thudding she'd heard earlier was growing louder, closer, like something heavy was moving toward them. She turned back to Adam, who was now rocking back and forth, clutching his knees to his chest. They're here, he whispered. The light bulb above them flickered one last time and then went out, plunging the room into darkness. Lara's flashlight was their only source of light now, and it barely pierced the gloom. She swung it around frantically, searching for any sign of what was coming, but the shadows seemed to swallow everything. Then she saw it. A figure, tall and twisted, standing in the far corner of the room, just outside the beam of her flashlight. It didn't move, just watched her with eyes that seemed to glow faintly in the dark. Another figure appeared beside it, then another, until the room was filled with them, silent, unmoving, and all staring at her. Lara backed away her heart pounding in her chest. She grabbed Adam's arm and tried to pull him to his feet, but he wouldn't move. His eyes were locked on the figures, his body trembling with fear. The figures began to move, slowly at first, then faster, their twisted limbs reaching out toward her. Lara screamed, pulling Adam with all her strength, but it was no use. The darkness closed in around them, and the last thing Lara heard was Adam's voice, whispering in her ear, you can't escape, no one ever does. And then, there was only silence. Story number 10. The old Redfield Sanitarium had been abandoned for as long as anyone could remember. Perched on a lonely hill, it stood as a monument to madness, its cracked windows like empty eyes staring out over the town below. Kids dared each other to go inside, but few had the courage to even step foot on the overgrown path leading up to it. Local legend said the patients never left that their tortured souls still wandered the halls, trapped in their final moments of despair. Jessica never believed in ghosts. As a journalist, she prided herself on digging up the truth behind every story, no matter how unsettling. When her editor suggested a piece on urban legends, Redfield Sanitarium was the obvious choice. It had been the subject of rumors and horror stories for decades, and Jessica was determined to uncover the real history behind the myths. Armed with a camera and a flashlight, Jessica pushed open the front door of the sanitarium. It groaned in protest, the sound echoing through the hollow building. Inside, the air was stale, thick with dust, and the faint scent of mildew. The dim light of the setting sun filtered through the broken windows, casting long shadows across the floor. Jessica moved through the lobby, her footsteps crunching on shattered glass. 
The walls were lined with faded photographs, doctors, nurses, and patients, all frozen in time. The smiles in the pictures seemed forced, as if they were hiding something beneath the surface. She shuddered and moved deeper into the building. The halls were narrow, with peeling paint and rusted metal doors. The sanitarium had been abandoned in a hurry, with files and medical equipment still scattered across the floors. Jessica imagined the chaos that must have ensued when the place shut down. Patients and staff alike scrambling to leave behind whatever horrors had occurred within these walls. She reached the second floor and found herself in the patient wing. The rooms were small and claustrophobic, each one containing a single rusted bed frame and a barred window. As she shone her flashlight into each room, she felt a growing sense of unease. It was as if the walls were closing in on her, the air growing heavier with each step. Then she heard it, a faint sound, almost like a whisper. She froze, listening. It was distant at first, but it grew louder, echoing through the empty halls. It sounded like someone crying, a low, mournful sob that sent a chill down her spine. Jessica hesitated. She had been alone in the building, hadn't she? She took a deep breath, telling herself it was just the wind, or perhaps an animal that had wandered inside. But the sound continued, unmistakable now. Someone was crying. She followed the noise down the hall, her flashlight beam trembling as she moved. The sobbing grew louder, more desperate. It was coming from one of the rooms at the far end of the corridor. Jessica's heart pounded in her chest as she approached, her nerves on edge. She reached the door and paused. The crying was right on the other side, soft and pitiful, like that of a child. Jessica hesitated for a moment before pushing the door open. The room was empty. The sobbing stopped abruptly, the silence pressing down on her like a weight. Jessica swept her flashlight across the small space, but there was no sign of anyone. Just an old bed frame and a cracked mirror hanging on the wall. She stepped inside, her heart racing, and approached the mirror. It was smeared with grime, but she could just make out her reflection in the dim light. And then she saw it. Behind her, in the reflection, stood a figure. It was a small, frail form, barely visible in the shadows. Jessica spun around, but the room was empty. The figure was gone. She turned back to the mirror, but there was nothing there now. Just her own pale face, staring back at her. A cold sweat broke out on her forehead as she backed out of the room, her mind racing. She didn't believe in ghosts, but she couldn't deny what she had seen. Something was in the sanitarium with her, something that didn't want her there. Jessica hurried back down the hall, her flashlight beam cutting through the darkness. She wanted to leave, to get out of this place, but she also knew she had a story to tell. The sobbing started again, fainter this time, but it seemed to follow her as she moved through the building. She reached the lobby and headed for the exit, but as she approached the door, it slammed shut with a force that rattled the windows. Jessica jumped, her pulse racing. She grabbed the handle and pulled, but the door wouldn't budge. It was as if the building itself was trapping her inside. A faint laugh echoed through the room, sending a shiver down her spine. She turned, shining her flashlight across the lobby, but saw nothing. The laugh grew louder, more menacing, until it filled the space around her. It was mocking, taunting, as if the very walls were alive with malice. Panic set in as Jessica fumbled with the door, her hands shaking. She slammed her shoulder against it, but it remained firmly shut. The laughter swirled around her, growing louder, more oppressive. She stumbled back, her breath coming in short, frantic gasps. And then, as suddenly as it had started, the laughter stopped. Jessica froze, listening to the deafening silence. Her flashlight flickered and went out, plunging her into darkness. She frantically tapped it, trying to bring the light back, but it refused to work. She was alone, trapped in the dark with whatever malevolent presence haunted the sanitarium. A faint light appeared at the end of the hall, a soft, eerie glow that seemed to pulse with a life of its own. Jessica felt an inexplicable pull toward it, as if something was beckoning her deeper into the building. Against her better judgment, she found herself moving toward the light, her feet dragging as if under someone else's control. As she neared the source of the glow, she realized it was coming from one of the patient rooms. The door was slightly ajar, and the light spilled out into the hallway, casting long shadows on the walls. Jessica's heart pounded in her chest as she reached for the door, 
her hand trembling. She pushed it open and stepped inside. The room was bathed in an unnatural light, and in the center stood a figure. A woman, her back turned to Jessica. She wore an old, tattered hospital gown, her long hair matted and tangled. The air in the room felt thick, heavy with the weight of something unspeakable. Who are you? Jessica whispered, her voice barely more than a breath. The woman didn't respond. She remained still, her head bowed as if lost in thought. Jessica took a step closer, her curiosity battling with her fear. Why are you here? She asked, her voice a little louder this time. Slowly, the woman began to turn. As she did, the light in the room flickered, and the temperature dropped sharply. Jessica's breath caught in her throat as the woman's face came into view. It was pale, almost translucent, with hollow eyes that seemed to stare through her. And then the woman smiled, a twisted, unnatural grin that sent a jolt of terror through Jessica's body. Before she could react, the woman lunged forward, her form dissolving into shadow. The light in the room flared brightly, blinding Jessica for a moment, and when it faded, the room was empty once again. Jessica stumbled back, her heart racing. The door to the room slammed shut behind her, and she heard the sound of footsteps, dozens of them, echoing through the hall. She ran, not knowing where she was going, just needing to get away from whatever haunted the building. She turned a corner and found herself back in the lobby, the front door standing wide open. Without hesitation, she sprinted toward it, bursting out into the night air. She didn't stop running until she was far away from the sanitarium her breath coming in ragged gasps. When she finally looked back, the building stood silent and dark, as if nothing had happened. But Jessica knew better. The Redfield Sanitarium held its secrets close, and those who dared to uncover them risked becoming part of its twisted history. And as she stood there, catching her breath, she could still hear the faint echoes of laughter in the wind, a reminder that the forgotten never truly rest.